Welcome to this celebration and be seated. We will now hear from the South Brunswick High School String Quartet.
upon the Reverend Patty Wartford of the Presbyterian Church of Basking Ridge to deliver the invocation. Friends, let us pray. Eternal and merciful and wonderful God, we know that all wisdom comes from you. Today we are gathered together to pray your blessing on this court, that this group of men and women will always render justice in your name. Grant them the desire, the capacity, and the will to seek your perspective in all of their deliberations. Especially, we pray your blessing on Associate Justice Helen Holmes. Invest Justice Holmes this day, faithful God, with an extra measure of your wisdom and truth, making her gifts a compliment and encouragement to this body. Strengthen and sustain her in loving service to our community, to the state of New Jersey, to our nation, and to your will. All praise be to you, gracious God, for making this day which we all rejoice. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. The national anthem will now be performed by the Sounds of South Florida. begins another chapter of excellence in her distinguished life on surely one of the great courts in this land. I had the privilege of speaking at the ceremony a little over 12 years ago when she first became a judge. All who knew her then were certain that she would distinguish herself on the bench and she has been all that we knew she would be, a splendid amalgam of hard work, legal acumen, insight, and above all, a sense of compassion and humanity for all those who appear before her. Helen's idea of a great vacation, in fact, last year was to twice travel south to help rebuild homes for the victims 
of Hurricane Katrina. That says a lot about a person. It is said that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and that is certainly the case here. Those who know Helen's mother, Mary Hones, and had the pleasure of knowing her father, our partner, Charlie Hones, and who had the great delight of seeing Helen become a member of the bench 12 years ago, shortly before he passed on, know where these wonderful traits come from. So in thinking about what to say today, and I'm sure as Helen can attest to, there is little uh, that we don't know about her after the many great comprehensive articles uh, that we've all read about in the papers in the last couple of weeks. Instead, my thoughts kept drifting back to Charlie Holmes, who I'm quite sure is watching from up there somewhere today, once again being delighted on this great occasion. So I kept trying to think to myself, what would Charlie say if he were here? We all fondly recall Charlie Holmes holding court in the firm library as the honer, or the old professor as we called him, the latter term being an attribution to the likes of Casey Stangle had Casey been a lawyer. Charlie poured through both the sports pages and the advance sheets on a daily basis, looking for some quirky case to expound upon to us or detailing why he thought some judge had gotten it all wrong. He was a true Renaissance man, equally at home in the Metropolitan Opera or at a hockey game, enjoying everything from Puccini to heckling Brett Hull about why he hadn't scored a goal yet at the top of his lungs, with Hull looking up in the stands and pointing a stick at him a moment or two later after scoring, certainly a moment that I'll never forget. Charlie, also being a giant fan, uh, took hold of a comment Alex Webster made one day when trying to explain why one of his players seemed to have a problem finishing plays. Alex Webster said, you can't teach good feet. After that, Charlie took hold of that, and any time anybody made some type of a silly mistake or did something to embarrass themselves, Charlie would smirk, look over at me, and simply say, bad feet. Or if they did something one might equate to being street smart or clever in the face of some difficult situation, he would say, good feet. They became constant code words for us. He would also say that he could pretty much predict within the first two years of observing how a new lawyer interacted with others and went about their work as to whether that lawyer would or would not go on to become a distinguished lawyer or perhaps the contrary. So as lawyers moved through their careers in what he considered either a positive or negative fashion, Charlie would note some reference to them, then just kind of smile, mention their name, nod over to me and say, see, two years, I told you. So on this great day, I can find no more fitting tribute to our dear friend and former partner, Helen Hones, than to sum her up, as I'm sure the old professor would have. See, two years, I told you so, good feet. <laughs> Helen, we know you will once again do us all proud with your background as a terrific lawyer, an excellent judge with a distinguished record of service, and above all, for being the wonderful person you are. It is not only a great day for you, but a great day for the justice system, for this court and for the people of New Jersey, congratulations. And now for some remarks, I call upon the Honorable John J. Gibbons, the former Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and who quite simply has been a giant of the bench and the bar in this state for over 50 years, Judge Gibbons. May it please the court. I'm honored to have been invited to speak briefly on this happy occasion for Justice Holmes, for the Holmes family, for her new con colleagues on the Supreme Court of New Jersey, and for the people of New Jersey. This is also for me the second such occasion, for I was also one of the well-wishers when on March 31st, 1994, Judge Holmes took the oath of office as a Superior Court judge. That ceremony probably was for the Holmes family even a more joyous one than is today's, for as Wayne said, in 1944, or 1994, Helen's father was among the living and could take appropriate pride in the accomplishments of his remarkably talented daughter. Charles Holmes was, as I noted in the 1994 ceremony, a distinguished member of the bar and a friend of mine 
from 1950 when we took the bar ex exam and the bar review course together. <clears throat> Ours was the kind of friendship in which he qu felt quite free after I was appointed to the bench to write occasional letters to me pointing out what was wrong with one or another of my opinions. <laughs> I suspect that had he lived longer, he would have rendered the same sort of constructive criticism to, for Helen's opinions. <laughs> and it would have been as good for her as it would, was for me. <laughs> Justice Holmes was, I think, Gibbons Law Clerk number 18. At least 38 followed her. Among the 50 some odd, she is the only one who has ever been appointed to the bench. How she alone, among them all, managed to avoid the taint of a Gibbons clerkship <laughs> and achieve that appointment is somewhat of a mystery. <laughs> but there's no mystery about the reasons for her elevation to the Supreme Court. As a Superior Court judge, she earned the reputation of a judge <clears throat> possessing all the positive character traits that we think should make a good judge. She's been unfailingly gracious to litigants and lawyers, unfailingly thorough in her preparation, unfailingly industrious in carrying her share and more of judicial work, lucid in her opinions and th thorough in her legal research. As a Superior Court judge, Justice Holmes was of course obliged to follow the precedents laid down by her superiors in the hierarchical arrangements of the judicial branch. In her new position, she will be much more free than she has been to try to move the law toward what she perceives to be a more desirable outcome. In thinking about that new freedom, I was reminded of the work we did together during the year that Justice Holmes was my law clerk. That happened to be a year in which we had several cases that were not merely contentious, but emotionally draining. The one that still stands out in my mind most vividly is Hallerman against Penhurst State School and Hospital, involving a challenge to the harsh conditions in which the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania confined mentally retarded young people. This litigation went on for many years with two trips to the United States Supreme Court. But in 1979, it was new and we devoted an enormous amount of time to discussing the harsh plight of the inmates and the legal obstacles to be overcome before they could achieve any meaningful relief. I had selected Helen Holmes as a clerk primarily because of her outstanding academic record both as an undergraduate at William and Mary and as a law student in Georgetown. Working with her, it soon became apparent that beside her intellectual prowess, she was also confident, articulate, candid, and very often humorous. But as we worked together on the difficult Penhurst case, it became apparent to me that something deeper and finer moved, moved this young woman. For her, the mentally retarded inmates were objects worthy of compassion, sympathy, and kindness. Thus, she looked beyond the pleadings and briefs to the parties as human beings. Although we never had any explicitly theological discussions, 
It was apparent to me that her attitude toward the parties as human beings, her moral compass, if you will, was a reflection of her faith-based con conviction as to the worth of every human being. <clears throat> I mentioned this recognition that every litigant is worthy of sympathy and kindness because while all good judges should keep in mind the human beings that will be affected by their judgments, those who sit on the supreme courts of this or any state and thus are more free to move the law toward more humane outcomes than our judges in the lower courts have a heightened responsibility. Knowing Justice Holmes for 28 years, I'm confident that in the Supreme Court of New Jersey, she will discharge that heightened responsibility in the highest traditions of this great court. She has been a first-rate litigator and a distinguished superior court judge. Now she will become a great justice. Thank you. Now it's my great privilege and pleasure to ask the Honorable Sylvia Pressler, former presiding judge for administration of our appellate division, another great jurist, and in a sense, welcome home because you have so many of your great colleagues here. Sylvia. Well, it looks like I'm only the only member who's here for the first time on this Helen team, but I am most happy to be here. It is a great pleasure and a singular privilege to have the opportunity to speak to you a bit about my friend, Helen Holmes. Helen's distinguished academic career, a high honors degree from William and Mary, an honors degree from Georgetown Law School, an editorship of the Georgetown Law Journal, her clerkship with Judge John Gibbons on the Third Circuit, and her distinguished professional career in private practice and as a jurist of the state in both the trial and appellate divisions are all well documented and easily available on the internet. Just Google in Helen Hones and a stream of impressive information pops up but her academic and professional credentials, outstanding as they are, don't begin to tell you who Helen Holmes is. Helen is an extraordinary woman. We all know that she knows a lot of law and she is very, very smart. And anyone who doesn't know is about to see her formidable intellectual talents in action. And she is, of course, the consummate professional learned, scholarly, independent of mind, compassionate, and in possession of an unerring judgment about justice, fairness, and the right thing to do for the right reason. But even more than that, she is a woman of the most extraordinary personal courage, who has that rarest of all gifts, the force of will and the indomitable spirit that turns adversity into triumph. My admiration for Helen is without bounds. I first met Helen when she was temporarily assigned to my part of the appellate division as a tryout for a six-week stint at the beginning of the 2002 term. Of course, I had known her by reputation and by those of her trial court cases which I had reviewed, and they were all beautifully handled with the skill, grace, sensitivity, and careful reasoning of the master jurist, even those few which we reversed. <laughs> but, you know, as I always say, the last word is not necessarily the right word. 
I didn't, however, then know and soon learned what a pleasure, how much fun it was to work with her. She has a wonderful sense of humor. At least we always laughed at the same things. She's, she's clever, witty, warm, compassionate. And on the professional side, she was always prepared and always had given productive thought to our cases, always had something significant significant to contribute to the judicial process of our part. She was, in short, the ideal appellate judge and the ideal colleague. I recalling, recall calling Chief Justice Poritz at the end of her first week and saying, the tryout is over. <laughs> Helen is a keeper. It is indeed the appellate division's great loss that it kept her for so brief a time, but it is surely the gain of the legal community of this state and all its people to have the benefit of the luster she will certainly bring to our highest court. There is no doubt that Helen will enhance what is already a great Supreme Court. The performance by the South Brunswick string players remind me that I have always likened the operation of the parts of the appellate division to a string quartet. Used to be a trio. We too are ensemble players. Our voices must blend, although from time to time one or the other of us takes the lead, plays the melody. It takes an enormous amount of self-restraint and deference, the willingness to listen as well as to speak, and the capacity to rethink and reanalyze. The performance can be ruined by a single strident voice. And although we can argue about interpretation and rehearsal, the court can only function effectively in producing its opinions if it is guided by each judge's diligence and active participation and by an unwavering mutual respect and esteem. Helen, independent as she is, and with the individual philosophical predilections to which we are all subject, is nevertheless the perfect ensemble player. Her voice is never missing or muted or discordant. It is always heard, but always in harmony and always hitting just the right note. That's the essence, really, of the extraordinary collegiality of the appellate division she has mastered it completely, and it will serve her and the Supreme Court well in the years to come. So I rejoice with Helen on her having reached this awesome pinnacle of her career, both because I truly love her and because I have the confidence that the progressive jurisprudence which has characterized our Supreme Court since its modern inception is in safe hands. I congratulate Governor Corzine for having recognized Helen's unique personal, intellectual, and jurisprudential gifts, and I congratulate the Senate for its wisdom, finally the legislature in its wisdom, <laughs> in having confirmed her nomination without a single dissenting vote. I know you all share with Helen the joy of this day and the promise of such bright and happy prospects for the future. The Office of Attorney General of the State of New Jersey has had a terrific reputation in these United States. Uh, the present occupant in just a few months has already enhanced the reputation of that office. I give you Stuart Rabner. Thank you, Chief Justice Azali, Associate Justices of the Supreme Court, retired yet vibrant justices who are with us, distinguished guests, family, and friends. First, I wanted to thank the very thoughtful person who faxed me a copy of today's program yesterday before I prepared any remarks, because when I realized that I was speaking after Wayne Positan, Judge Gibbons, Judge Pressler, I realized that there would be few superlatives that had not been spoken and fewer still accomplishments that had gone unnoticed. In other words, the pressure was completely off 
to be asked to speak at this point in the program. So I thought I might add a few words about the selection process. I'm not getting into any advice that the former chief counsel may have given the governor. I leave questions of privilege and waiver to other legal giants in the room, but to speak a bit about the process and, and the panel's reaction to meeting Justice Holmes. After we spent time together to a person, we all felt that we had a chance to get to know Judge Holmes, to appreciate her wisdom and candor, her intellect, and her breadth of experience. But we also felt as though we had had a chance to meet Helen Holmes, whose personal strength, humanity, and grace left us speechless. All of us believed then and now that you would add luster to a court, to the finest Supreme Court in the land, comprised of outstanding jurists, which is known for its opinions and their thoughtfulness and depth. But the truth is, whatever the panel thought didn't really matter all of that much, because the one voice in the process that had yet to speak belonged to a gentleman who sports a uh, blue sweater vest and a beard. His announcement, his decision, really speaks for itself. I was given the very pleasant and unexpected pleasure of having a chance to convey congratulations on behalf of Governor Corzine just recently. As you know from the media, the governor is in the region of Iraq right now. He was given permission by the Department of Defense last week after a number of requests to go and travel there. He wanted to visit with our troops, including the contingent from the New Jersey National Guard that is stationed there, and he wanted to show support for our soldiers who are so bravely serving our country in a very perilous situation. He left Iraq, as you know, is still in the area and of course cannot be here, but asked if his words could be read aloud. Dear Justice Holmes, I'm delighted to extend heartfelt congratulations as we commemorate your investiture as an Associate Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. This is a most deserved honor, and I am pleased to have appointed such an able jurist and proud daughter of Somerset County to one of the finest courts in the nation. Your record speaks to your legal distinction, judicial independence, and strength of character. You represent the highest standards in intellect, integrity, and ethical behavior. I have been deeply impressed by the clarity with which you've written your decisions, your fair-mindedness, and thoughtful approach to protecting individual rights, and the high regard in which your colleagues hold you. And I believe your father, one of the great lawyers in the history of New Jersey, would have been quite proud of you today and every day. The New Jersey Supreme Court has a rich history that reaches back before the American Revolution. Each term it makes a fundamental impact on the application of our Constitution and the laws of the state. I have every confidence that you will join those who have come before you in bringing excellence and pride to the court. And I know you will serve the people of New Jersey with fairness, a commitment to the rule of law, and a passion for preserving equal justice for everyone in our society. Once again, congratulations to you and my warmest regards to Robert and Charles. I wish you every success in the years to come. Sincerely, John S. Corazon. Justice, congratulations as you continue your illustrious career of public service. Justice Hones, Chief Justice Ports, Judge Gibbons, my colleagues, the Associate Justices, Judge Kressler, Wayne, General, and friends. Uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to preside over the coronation of Queen Helen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that choral group, that choir, she's warming up the Boston Pops for the reception. Uh, I'm reminded of the fellow on the Titanic who rang for the steward and said, steward, I asked for ice water, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's every bit of it is deserved. Uh, it really is. Judge Gibbons, I was fascinated by your comments, including what you did not say, uh, a couple of things. You, you mentioned as I recall that you had over 50 
odd clerks, and of all of those clerks, and then you paused, and I was concerned. I thought you were going to say, of those 50 odd clerks, Helen was the oddest. <laughs> but that, uh, and the other uh, item I thought you would mention is the fact that I, I heard this from a little voice, a little whisper not too long ago, that in that interview some years ago, when you interviewed our great new justice, Helen Hones, you alluded to your own ideology and referenced the fact that you were pretty liberal and you were hopeful she would be happy there, but she ought to think about that. To which I'm told she responded, uh, I just want you to know that when I have to, I'm going to challenge you, and when I have to, I'm going to disagree with you. And she got the job. Uh, that's great for Judge Gibbons, but Helen, you and I have to have a talk. Uh, I, I'm reminded, do you remember, oh, four decades ago, some of you of my vintage, that uh, this, I'll paraphrase it for Helen's benefit, um, the book and movie, The Love Story by Eric Siegel. To paraphrase it, Helen, love, love means never having to say, I dissent. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that line fits a lot better with one or two of my colleagues. <laughs> Now, having heard all of the well-deserved praise about Helen, one can ask, and one or two of you have alluded to this, what more can be said? Put it differently, because of our distinguished speakers, the press coverage, everything that could be said has been said. Not quite. Yes, we have heard about her splendid personal and professional qualities, but there is so much that you don't know there is so much that I don't know and that we will never know. Some close to her have told me that we just don't know the half of it. And that is because there are so many ways in which she has personally and privately, without hoot or holler, helped out numerous others on planet Earth. With characteristic humility, she doesn't talk about her daily acts of, client, of kindness for for friends, for family, and for strangers. Of the many, th or the many things that she has done, as I understand it, from pretty good authority, at great personal sacrifice. She has, as you know, been a great daughter, uh, a splendid wife, and yes, the best, the very best of parents. She has been. Her creed, her credo, is helping others that is her calling. Whether it's teaching Sunday school in Basking Ridge or the trips to Mississippi to help people rebuild their lives, she's always been there. I asked someone what word fits her best. They said selfish, uh, selfless, <laughs> selfless. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> That was not intended, okay? <laughs> the, but the quality, the quality that, this is what so many have said to me, the quality that fits her so eminently is selflessness. Um, and it does distinguish her. I, I think there's another word based on my observation and everything that I've heard and seen Besides the selflessness, it's sheer, raw courage. And that's the difference between goodness and greatness. I give you Helen Holmes.
all sit down. No, not here. One little item so that you know that we cannot find the oath. Uh, and <laughs> that, don't put that on me. Okay? Someone must have uh, picked it up with their papers. Yeah. No? Well, we could. The. Uh, I can why don't I, why don't I just uh, why don't you uh, why don't I do my remarks and then we'll do the oath that's that's right, fine let's do that. by that time anyway. we I, I I think I can remember it frankly I've done it enough times but you guys I can all wait? Before I uh, start my actual remarks while everyone is rushing about the room trying to figure out where the oath got to um, there are a couple people that I need to recognize who are here today and are very special as far as this day is concerned. Uh, the first one is my brother Charles. Uh, he was instrumental in arranging for us to have this beautiful, beautiful space. He has been active with the Masonic fraternity following in my father's footsteps for many, many years. Uh, and he's really responsible for this room today. Second, I need to recognize his daughter, Bonnie, and her husband, Jamie Capes. I think they're both in the back of the room. And they are responsible for all the wonderful music that you've heard so far and that you'll continue to hear downstairs in the reception. And I thank them very, very much as well. The third person that I need to single out is my cousin, John. He is here with his wife, Diane, from Virginia Beach. Uh, my cousin, John, uh, in August uh, was elevated to major general and I was invited to participate in a ceremony somewhat like this to honor him on that day. And as luck would have it, that turned out to be one of the days when I was uh, summoned for an opportunity to participate in the selection process for this position. When I called my cousin John and told him I wasn't sure that I could be there and I was very distressed by this, his response was it was okay for me to miss his ceremony, but I'd better be sure I get this job so that he can be here with me today. <laughs> my cousin, Major General John P. McLaren, Jr. <laughs> Two stars. That's two stars. I, uh, I've given an enormous amount of thought to what I might say today. Um, fortunately for me, I've been at a lot of these kinds of events, uh, and so I have a lot of uh, other people that I can look to to decide what I should say today. Now, there's only two kinds of speeches that you can give at an event like this. One is the one that I call the message. That's one with some great soaring principles where you, you discuss uh, learned learned uh, subjects and you quote from people uh, and you really, you really have a great message for people. That's the kind of a speech that our Chief Justice gave uh, a couple of weeks ago when he had his ceremony. And you might remember uh, that one of the quotes that he used had to do with the obligation of the courts to look out for the people in the margins and the people in the shadows. The problem for me is I don't do those kinds of speeches. I, I don't have any great soaring message. I don't quote people, uh, so that's not going to work for me. Fortunately, there's an option. The second option that I've noted over the years is what I refer to as the Academy Award performance. And that's the one where you thank people. Uh, now, some of them are a little scary because it ends up with someone thanking everyone who had anything to do with what they did in their life and everyone in the room, and you go on and on. The problem is you run the risk of what I refer to as the Academy Award moment, and that's where you skip over someone. Now, it's okay if you skip over someone like Judge Gibbons, who will forgive me and everyone knows how important he is to me. But if I forget to mention my husband, you will all go downstairs and think we're headed for a divorce. <laughs> that's a big risk. Fortunately for me, there is a third version, it's really a version of the Academy Award speech. And that's the one where you pick out one person, one person who has meant so much to your life that they really need to be recognized. 
on March 31st, 1994. That's the version of a speech I used. And everybody in that room was surprised, maybe even shocked, because they all thought that I was going to speak about my father. And I chose not to. I honored instead my mother. My mother is a first generation American, and I spoke about how her struggles and the opportunities that were denied to her were so important in shaping me and the kind of person that I became. Six weeks after that day, we buried my father. And people asked me whether I regretted having missed my one moment to stand up and honor him. And I told them no. My father knew how much he meant to me. And anybody who was in that room that day, sitting, seeing him sitting in the front row, bursting with pride, they all knew. They knew how much he meant to me and how much I meant to him. No, I did not regret not honoring my father. And someone asked me recently, well, here's your big chance. You're never going to have a chance like this again. This is the time you can make it up to him. But the answer is no. Today is not the day to honor my father either. Today is the day to honor the one person who really is responsible for creating in me those qualities of kindness and patience and compassion and courage that the newspapers have seen fit to write about and others have stood up here to celebrate. And it's really ironic because he's the one person in this room who can't read those newspapers, who wouldn't get it if he saw it on TV, who doesn't understand what I'm saying, and who only has figured out that if he keeps his act together long enough, there's probably a food event to follow. <laughs> Today is the day to honor my son, Charles. Charles is not the son I planned on, not the kid who goes to an Ivy League school, not the kid who finds the cure to cancer, takes care of me in my old age, no. Instead, my son will always need others to care for him will always live separate and apart with others looking after him, will never be independent, will never understand the words I'm saying. And as for my old age, I'm on my own as far as my son is concerned. You see, my son is one of those people in the shadows that the Chief Justice talked about. He is one of those lives in the margins. Everybody in this room has run into somebody like my son. Maybe you've been going through the grocery store and you come upon them, a little mismatched herd. One kid's pushing the cart, somebody else is hanging onto the edge doing something like this. Another one's being brought back by a normal staff person. Sally, stay with the group, don't get away. If you get lost, we won't be able to find you. And the fourth is always clutching a sheaf of papers or pictures and staring at the shelf. Johnny, find the piece. Johnny, find the piece. Look at your picture, match it to the piece. Oh, too bad, Johnny. Those are the beans. Try to get the peas. Maybe you've seen them in the convenience store. You go in there, you want aspirin for your headache, and there's somebody with stuff all around them in the aisle lining up the boxes. Maybe you've seen them in the fast food store. You've got your tray. You're in a hurry. For Pete's sake, who goes into a fast food restaurant unless they're in a hurry? And here's some kid wiping the table or sweeping the floor. You've all run into kids just like mine. And if you're at all like me, when you run into those people, you're annoyed. You're annoyed. These people are in our way. And why is that? Because we live our lives in a hurry. From the time we're very small, the message we get over and over is life is short. The race is to the swift, or in the words of my grandmother, known in the family as the original Helen Hones, usually said to me with a carving knife in her hand, one side or a leg off. We live our lives in a hurry. These people are in our way. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I was not raised to care about other people. I spent more hours than I can remember in rooms just like this one, learning about the importance of a life of service. I won awards from the Red Cross for the number of volunteer hours I gave. I was invited to Washington to give a speech having to do with looking past people's disabilities for the work I'd done at the East Orange Veterans Hospital. But the fact of the matter is, all of that was something I fit in. It was something I made time for. And all of that changed 
when I met my son. Because to live with a child in the shadows is to live in the shadows yourself. To live with my child is to understand what it is, what it is like to be in the margins. You know, you learn things when you live in the margins. Living with a child like mine is overhearing more than one person on more than one occasion say something like, why did she bring him here? Why doesn't she put him away? It's walking behind my son in a wildlife refuge and seeing the people coming toward us as they pass him, the ones who think it's okay to stare or the ones who think it's okay to imitate that funny way he walks or the hand poses that are so much a hallmark of autism or the noises. Living with a child like mine is spending a lot of time on your knees at night asking God to cure him, and then giving up on that prayer and asking instead, well, God, if you won't lighten my load, how about strengthening my back? It's hours and hours in offices with faceless people pleading, pleading with them to put your kid's name at the bottom of a waiting list already 5,000 names long, and then praying every night that enough governors find enough money in enough budgets that there'll be something for your child, that there'll be a place for your child. It is a life spent begging. But it's not all bad, because you learn things in the margins. You see things there in the shadows. Well, for one thing, you learn about the people in the margins. You learn just how hard it is to teach little Johnny how to pick out the can of peas. You know, all of that is based on matching, and hours and hours and hours are spent. Match the circles, match the yellow dots, match this, match that. And what you learn is, it's hard enough to teach a kid to match two pictures right in front of him that are identical. But try getting him to match a picture with an object on the shelf. And God save the Republic. If the picture in his hand is Del Monte Peas, and the only kind on the shelf this week happens to be Green Giant, None of you could pick that out as peas if you couldn't read. You learn those things in the shadows. You learn other things. You learn why the kid lines the boxes up like that. The good people at Eden Institute decided they would teach my child to stock shelves. It's a wonderful life skill, and it's a job skill that might help him in the future. So they decided they were going to teach him to stock shelves, and I don't know why, but the first thing he was going to stock with were soda cans. And my child, who will never, ever, ever learn to tie his shoes, figured out with the very first can how to surreptitiously pull it up to his head and go, Phoot! before he put it on the shelf. <laughs> that was as far as they got with the soda cans. But these people are determined. And they decided, fine, Charlie, fine. We're going to teach you how to stock the shelves. And they decided to use cans of beans. Now, for a child like mine, and for any autistic person, the critical thing is to finish the task. Finished is a huge problem. Because to my kid, the job is finished when that box of cans has been put on that shelf. No matter that there's not enough room on the shelf for all the cans in the box. You just push them in and shove them in until they're popping out the back, flying on the floor, and until you very nearly topple the whole assembly. And that's why the kid in the convenience store lines up the boxes so they're straight, because that's how he knows he's finished, even if there are still some in the box. I wouldn't know that if I didn't live with the shadow people. I would just think that child's annoying. They decided that uh, my child uh, works most days in a work center, and he does a variety of jobs there. He folds papers and he does mailings. But if he's really lucky, Charlie gets to go out with a mobile crew that goes out and it cleans movie theaters. And Charlie gets to vacuum up the popcorn without eating it. Um, but if he's really lucky, if he's really lucky, they let him go out front with a spray bottle and some cloths and he gets to wipe the fingerprints off the glass doors. I have no idea how he knows when that task is finished, but he loves to wipe the fingerprints off the front doors. You learn things from the margins. You learn things about your family, about the people who are always there for you. Like my mother, who more times than I can count, dropped what she was doing and rushed to meet the bus because I was stuck in traffic. Or watch Charlie because Robert and I needed to just get away for a few days. 
you learn things like my brother John and his wife Alice, who more evenings than I can count took Charlie home after school when he was little because I had to work, or my brother Charles and his wife Lorna, who when holidays at our house got just too stressful for Charlie, just quietly made a place at their table for us. Or my cousin John, on what had to be the biggest day of his life when he got his first star as Brigadier General, not only insisted that we bring Charlie, but insisted that he have a place up front with the other honored guests. He should have gotten his second star right on the spot for that act of courage. When you live in the margins, you also learn that there are people who aren't there because they have to be there like me, but who choose to be there, who choose to work with the folks in the margins. People like Gary Montgomery. We laugh about it all the time, but when my child needs a tetanus shot or a blood test, Gary's the one who puts him in the car and takes him because he knows I'm barely safe with my child at the doctor's office when there's no more involved than looking in his ears. Surely I will be injured if there is a needle involved. Or people like Joanne Monaco. If you read this week's Star Ledger, you learned a little of her. When my child's rages threatened my very safety, Joanne Monaco taught me what the polite folks call crisis intervention. And it's nothing more than hand-to-hand -hand combat sufficient to enable me to take someone like him and get him down on the ground when he's in a rage until he's quiet. You haven't lived, ladies and gentlemen, until you've been in a high school gym basement with Joanne Monaco trying to throw her on the ground and nobody gets hurt. <laughs> or people like John Murtha. John Murtha gave up parts of more vacations than I remember to travel with us because an 18-year-old boy like my son shouldn't be riding on the Cali River rapid rides with his mother. John went so many places with us, we still call him our other son. There are too many people like them to name all of the people at Eden. And if I start to try to name them, or all the other people like them, I will in fact leave someone out and hurt someone's feelings. When you live in the shadows, it's not, however, just the folks who have devoted their lives to people like my son. It's the other people you encounter who just do something kind for you like Sylvia Pressler, insisting that we bring Charlie up to the lake because maybe he'd like a ride in a motorboat. Or my former partner, Don Volkert. Don Volkert, who always had time for the strange little boy who'd come crashing into his office when he was visiting me, upsetting the trash can and messing up the important papers, climbing up into Don's lap because he knew that the nice man would always give him a hug, and if he was really lucky, might help him find a cookie somewhere in the office. In that rabbit warren of offices, my child always managed to find him. But it's more than even the people who know you and are kind to you. It's total strangers you meet, like the four beefy duck hunters sitting in the six-man hot tub down at Chincoteague last December who just sort of shrugged and moved a little closer when my kid decided he wanted to be in that hot tub too. Or the waitresses who let me have the table in the corner and don't ask me to explain about that incident with my child leaping on the plate of nachos someone else had ordered. <laughs> it's more than them. It's even more than them. All around us, there are people who reach out and touch other lives for the better. It's the doctors who look for cures for diseases few people have and few people care about. It's the teachers with the regular school classes who include a disabled child in their class so that they can be part of a normal education. It's that rabbi up in central New Jersey who took a kid with not a whole lot more skills than mine and managed to teach him enough words in Hebrew that he could have a bar mitzvah like every other kid in his family had had. It's the people who volunteer for Special Olympics, the people who hire the handicapped, those people who somehow managed to teach a girl in a wheelchair how to dance. It's the people who haul their kids to a soup kitchen so they can serve a meal to the less fortunate. It's everybody who ever got on a plane and flew off to the godforsaken Gulf Coast to clean muck and goo out of somebody else's front parlor. It's hundreds and hundreds of people doing thousands and thousands of acts of kindness. 
And then there's a few people of extraordinary courage. There's people like David Holmes, who 30 plus years ago started a school for autistic children in a borrowed church basement and held out the promise of hope to every one of those parents that there would always be a place for their child, that their child would always be safe. Or people like Pat Weikert and Bob and Peggy Berenger, turning their sights toward sub-Saharan Africa and challenging a small congregation up in Basking Ridge to do something, to do something to try to eradicate extreme poverty in a country ravaged by AIDS like Malawi long before some pop star went there and managed to adopt a child who was probably one of the few who wasn't an orphan and wasn't touched by HIV. In the end, it is hundreds of acts of small courage and a few acts of great courage of people who are willing to shine a strong light right into the shadows and look carefully at the people who reside there. So maybe there is a bit of a message here after all. And maybe the message is this. One day, someday, each and every one of us, each and every one of you, will be walking through the grocery store and come upon Johnny and the mismatched herd trying to find the can of peas. Or you'll rush in looking for that bottle of aspirin and encounter the guy with the materials all around him trying to line up the boxes. And when that day comes, you will want more than anything else to rush by, to crash through, to be on your way. But when that day comes, stop. Stop and think back on today. Dig down deep into the reservoirs of patience and kindness and compassion that reside deep, deep inside of each of our souls and tell yourself this, somebody just like that, somebody just like that taught me everything I really needed to know to be an associate justice of the Supreme Court. And so I thank today Governor Corzine for this extraordinary honor. I thank all the people who helped me along the way, colleagues, friends, and family, but above all others, above all others, today I thank my son, Charles Robert Schwanberg, a son to be proud of. Charlie, stand up. Stand up. the oath, but from memory, <laughs> from memory and because of a couple of notes, uh, I, I think we were all set. And, and I asked Helen to, to repeat after me that, as follows, I, Helen Hones, I, Helen Hones do, solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I will support and uphold the Constitution of the United States I will support and uphold the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this state. And the Constitution of this state. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly perform. And that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly perform. All the duties of an Associate Justice. All the duties of the Associate Justice. Of the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Supreme Court of New Jersey. So help me God. So help me God.
But maybe, by the way, I was wrong to say Queen Helen. Maybe Saint Helen is a little bit closer to the mark. <laughs> For the benediction, we have the uh, Reverend Robert Beringer. If you would join us, Reverend, again of the Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church. Helen, with her characteristic candor, when she invited me to be here today, said, remember, you're the last thing before the food, so don't pray forever. <laughs> and uh, we certainly realize that. What a privilege to be a part of this gathering today. What a great and thoughtful message you have left on our hearts. And knowing your dad, I'm sure he said, amen. So, Let's bow before we're together in prayer. Oh God, we are thankful this day. We're thankful for the Hones family and for all that they and their love and their care have taught and given to Helen as she assumes this wonderful position in our state. We are thankful for Helen and for the amazing gifts that she brings and for her humanity and for her compassion, which touch all of our lives. We're thankful this day for this court and thankful, O oh God, for your blessing upon them as they give their very important leadership in the life of our state. And we're thankful this day for this nation, for our system of life and government together, and thankful that we may ask of your blessing on not only all who are gathered here, but on our people, that we may do justly, that we may love mercy, and that we may walk humbly with our God. To you be all glory and praise. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. And now we will close with the South Brunswick Concert Choir performing the Quest on Ending. 